So appreciate you guys hanging in. Uh, there have been a lot of questions throughout the day that uh, people wanted to ask the Selenium committee. So we do have uh, at least four people, and we are missing one other person. So there will be five people here who basically either hold the commit bit on the Selenium project or are eligible to hold this uh, commit bit. Do you guys want to quickly introduce yourself, and then we can get started? I will start. My name is Luke Eman Zemero. I've been uh, committing to the Selenium project for about four and a half years. I work at salesforce.com. I am currently in a UI development role there. Uh, Dave Hefner. I've been teaching about and writing about Selenium for the last few years, and I've recently, uh, as of earlier this year, become officially a committer. Uh, I'm Simon Stewart. I created WebDriver. I'm the current leader of the project. I'm a co-editor of the W3C specification, uh, and I'm here in India. Hello, India. Uh, I'm Marcus Merrill. I am actually not a committer. I've committed very little, but I've been using WebDriver since the, literally the day Simon debuted it at GTAC. We started using it the next day. I've now implemented it at four separate companies, all of which, to my knowledge, are still using the framework. So. I, I had some chops once in a while, once, once upon a time. Uh, I'm late, Julian, <laughs> and haven't committed code for several years, but you can, as you can tell, there's a long half-life, so you get called back for a while, and maybe I'll commit some code this weekend. Do it. All right. Uh, how many people have questions for the committee here? Quick show of hands. Good. This should be a lot more. Because uh, <laughs> we have 45 minutes to kill. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you have a track record. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start with the first question just to lighten up the mood. And then we're going to turn around and get people involved. Uh, so I would actually expect everyone on the panel to answer this question. Uh, if you had a time machine and you could go back, what is the one thing you would not do on the Selenium project? Uh, not commit code. <laughs> <laughs> commit code. No, teasing. Uh, I think I would like to have seen the mobile Selenium or mobile web driver continue. Uh, is this about the project itself or about my involvement with the project itself? Uh, I was going to say I overwrote the hell out of my first few implementations, and I could I wish I could have that back. Um, I think I I don't know I might have started the proxy stuff a little sooner because that's become such a large part of what I need in the project. But um, I, I could have done it. I just uh, didn't. So I, that's that's one I'd like to have back. Oh dear. Uh, well, the, the glib answer, the easy answer is a support library. Like, I take that back. It was just meant as demonstration code, and it sort of metastasized into this incredibly useful pile of stuff that people depend on for their lives, which is confusing and perplexing, because I'll be honest, some of it was written while I was drunk. Um, most. <laughs> most. <laughs> I think, more realistically, I wouldn't have changed much, but I would have gone faster. Like Selenium 3, we announced it <clears throat> a while ago, and it's taken us forever to ship, and actually it hasn't been a huge amount of code to get to that point. It's been finding the time to do it. And so the thing I would take back is misspending some of my time and focusing on shipping 3. Um, I would probably take back implicit weights <laughs> 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 and just make explicit weights the only option. That's a great answer. Can I can I change mine? Yes, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Glib, glib answers first. Uh, I would implement status codes in uh, WebDriver. <laughs> Get in the sea. <laughs> Get in the sea. <laughs> the other is I've already rewritten history since we use Git, and it's already there. Huh? What I would have changed. It's already in history. I've... Oh, oh if, you, if you had time to. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Simon wants to <laughs> get back. Those are, those are good nerd chops. 
All right, hopefully that kind of sets the stage for other people to ask questions now. Uh, so feel that's free to ask uh, you know, more controversial questions because that's going to be helpful. Right? Uh, who had a question? I think you had a question here. Can we have mics here? Simon, question to you is this. Uh, if we look at Selenium IDE or Selenium RC, we have a command set speed, for example, yeah. executing. That doesn't exist in web driver, actually. Yeah. It, 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 will, it will come in Selenium 3.0, this command, that, ki that kind of, because we need to control the speed. For example, if the application is heavily loaded, okay, or uh, network speed is slow, see that now our tests are failing, okay, even however, however you handle how much, no. You put some delay, something, something. It is failing. If we can, if we can control the speed, speed of execution, that improves our no. Improves those. Okay. Numbers. So this is ultimately, can you have a set speed command? Okay. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> there we okay. go. That's the answer. Okay. Okay. Um, the actual reason for it is um, twofold. Like you were saying that your application is taking a long time to respond when it's heavily loaded and stuff like that. That is precisely why we added the waiting classes, um, the explicit waits and the implicit waits to handle that case where the application is quite slow. The second reason is because, um, I don't know what language you're using, probably Java? Yeah, Java. In Java, it's trivial to wrap an interface um, and have a proxy implementation that does whatever you want it to. Like it's literally a few lines of code. Um, and so if you wanted to have that level of control, you could. Um, so there isn't any reason to put it into the core library. And the reason why we don't want to put things into the core library is because every line of code that we write is a line of code that needs to be maintained. And worse, it's a line of code that needs to be implemented by every single um, implementation. Now, you could do the set speed client side, you know, on the, on the local end of the test, right where you are. Um, in which case it would be in the support library, in which case it would just be something that wrapped a proxy in the way you went. Um, and in that case, you've already got the augmenter, so you could have your own augmentable in the way you'd go, um, and that would be like 10 lines of code. Um, or you'd have to do it on the remote end, in, and in that case, each of the browser vendors would have to implement um, the command themselves. And then, like, what does it apply to? Does it apply to finding elements or just interactions or certain kinds of interactions? And what about when you're using the advanced user interactions API and stuff like that? There's a bunch of decisions. Um, and you and your team are probably best placed to make those decisions rather than us going like, ah, we think this is probably going to be OK. You know, chances are we'd hit the Pareto point, right? 80% of the time it would be OK, but 20% of the time you'd be going like, nope, nope, nope. And then you'd want like timeouts on every method to be able to control that, and then it would just, it would cause an explosion in the size of the interface for very little benefit over what you can already do. Does that answer the question? I know that's not the answer you wanted to hear. <laughs> that's no code. That, you'd like a no code answer? No code. Oh, there's no core code either. But you could have the method added to WebDriver, technically. Cool. All right, we'll move next. Who had a question? I have a very basic question. Uh, that, uh, can we automate AngularJS application with uh, Selenium, or we contractor is the only choice? AngularJS. Web can you automate? So um, WebDriver Selenium is an API for automating a web browser. So anything that happens in the page of a web browser, the HTML and the CSS, you can automate that using WebDriver, exactly as a user would. If a user can use your Angular application, then you can, in theory, test it using WebDriver and Selenium. Now, the protractor stuff, the, the AngularJS test runner, actually has some hooks into WebDriver in order to, to facilitate that. So the technical answer is yes, if I'm understanding the question. But Dave, do you want to? Um, so ultimately, it's WebDriver JS with Protractor. So uh, effectively, WebDriver is automating the testing in Angular. But um, if you're not wanting to use Protractor, and the, if the question is, can we just use regular old WebDriver slinging our own test framework together, the answer is yes. Um, it just requires more care because you know you'd have to basically use a lot of explicit weights, 
to deal with the dynamic loading page content, and you have to uh, you know determine the locator strategy that you want to use, and all the stuff that normally goes into testing a web application. But there's nothing stopping you. It's just that Protractor is you know helpful. It make, it's like it just solves all these problems for you because it doesn't. You, it just does the waiting for you because it knows when the page state is ready. Um, and then you know if you actually were building the front end and you wanted to do integration testing and mock stuff out. You could do that as well. So, like, it really depends on what you're doing. But if you're trying to do black box testing and you don't want to use JavaScript, you could just do it in whatever language you want with whatever bindings you want, and there's really nothing stopping you. Sure. The so. one more concern is like uh, if you look at the Angular JS applications, right? They will miss class and ID attributes. They will be using most of the ng attributes. So in that case, we'll end up always writing the locators with the x path. So will it not become a uh, bad practice or something? So using x path is problematic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh. Um, we hear in most of the sessions, right, uh, stop using XPath, always uh, uh, look for ID or class. That way it will speed up your tests. Um, in terms of performance, like it, getting into the conversation of benchmarks of different locator strategies, um, I mean, unless you're using a really horrendous um, XPath, then the performance gain is kind of nominal between them. I mean, IDs and classes will always be the fastest. Um, and then if you look at using CSS selectors and XPath locators, um, that's actually a negligible difference in performance between those two. And then the only times where they're really horribly per, you know, poor performance are when it's really very large, very toothy, nested lookups. And then, well, I haven't run the benchmarks in Edge, but in IE 8, last time I ran these benchmarks, like 8, eight 9, 10, there's just a couple where like I, IE8 won't handle certain lookups, um, or it's just like an order of magnitude slower, which is like one or two cases, which are like locators you just should never use anyway. Um, but otherwise, across the board, it's typically, it's not bad. I mean, if you look at the benchmark data that was cited like pre-Selenium 2, it was horrible. Um, but everything since um, like 2012 and on has been fine, really. And so if you're trying to look for a performance gain, you typically get a lot more benefit out of like looking at your your weight strategies and uh, make sure that you, like you don't throw that sleeps and other kinds of stuff you get a lot more um, boost from that than you would just by trying to adjust your locators although I will say that test stability lives and dies by locators quite a bit so I would say that's you're not going to look to get performance um, in terms of speed gain but in terms of reliability of your test results potentially is an improvement so, I mean, general recommendation is to avoid uh, using XPath because of the stability aspect, not so much from a performance gain. It used to depend on the browser. Like, yeah. they used to be super, super slow. Um, the implementation of XPath in Internet Explorer was written in JavaScript. The JavaScript engine in IE was slow. But it's so better it's now. Really, like, really slow. But now it's, but now it's fine. Um, the more important point, as, as Dave says, is the maintainability of your tests decreases dramatically with complicated XPath expressions. Like today at the Bug Bash, somebody was showing me their, their sort of test, and there was a sort of multi-line XPath. And I was like, what the, I, what? And it was clearly like the best thing that they could do to find the element that they were looking for, but just looking at it was daunting. And figuring out whether or not it was right was like a, a real mental exercise, whereas Finding by ID, finding by even a CSS selector is so much clearer and so much more maintainable. Um, one thing that you can do, which I don't see people do terribly often, is web element has the ability to find sub elements. So if you call dot find element on a web element, you can just search that part of the subtree. So what you can do is you can break up these really complicated X paths into, well, I'll find something by an ID, then I'll find it by a class name, and then I'm just going to search a tiny subset of the tree for a very controlled X path expression. If you do that, remember, um, any XPath that begins with slash slash searches the entire document. So after painstakingly finding a subtree, if you then have an XPath expression that begins slash slash, you throw that all away and you go right from the top of the tree again, which is hilarious, but not what you want. So, so I, don't th I, I think that the general thought is that XPath is bad. Um, but I don't think that that's really true. I think that there are potential misuses of it, and the performance, though, is actually not as bad as it used to be. So I think it's actually a fine thing to use when used appropriately. Yeah, it's, it's just a foot cannon. Yeah. Do you all know what a foot cannon is? OK, so there's, there's an expression like, um, like you're pointing a loaded gun at your own foot. 
and it's up to you whether you pull the trigger or not. But what we've given you is a really good gun, and we've basically put it on your toes. But it's up to you whether you pull the trigger with it. Like, you can do maintainable XPath expressions, and that's fine. Yeah. All right, right let's move on use. in the spirit of yeah. giving uh, this quick. Who else has a question over there? Thank you. Compound class names, uh, whether that will be supported. Right now, it's not, right? In future, whether it will be supported. That's called CSS. Can you just repeat the question? The, the question was, uh, can, do, can compound class names yeah. um, be used? And the, an the quick answer is, by class name, no. By CSS, yes. So instead of doing a space in between the two class names, just put a dot in front of each of them, and you can it's valid CSS to say dot class one, dot class two, with no spaces. Yep. That's, yeah, just use CSS instead. OK. Yeah, thank you. Right. We have a question there, and then um, pass the mic back. Hey, the, good evening. Um, so morning, Simon was uh, referring that he started this as a pet project. And then uh, nine years back, you didn't envision this kind of a growth, right? So my question today is, what kind of a vision that you have for five years from now for selling them? Five years from now, the yeah. mission. Yeah. Actually, can you give a roadmap with dates? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. So yeah. actually, a long, a long time ago, I know when uh, I, more Christmas and Easter's will yeah. come. <laughs> so a long, a long time ago, when I was at, at, at Google, my manager at the time went, "How long do you think it's going to take until you get like the spec finished and 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 Selenium done?" And I was an engineer and I had a think, and I went, "It'll take about five years." Um, and my manager looked at me and went. That doesn't sound unreasonable. <laughs> that was only eight years ago. So as far as engineering estimates go, it was pretty accurate. <laughs> um, so the, I, I, the other thing is he asked me for the name, and I called it the Great Leap Forward, um, which is not a very good joke. There we go. Yeah, nobody ever gets it. But it's the reason why at a W3C meeting, I was asked whether I was a communist. Um, <laughs> these things happen. <laughs> Um, so the next five years are kind of interesting. Um, as we're closing out, as we're heading to Selenium 3, Selenium 4, we're, we're at the point where the specification, the W3C spec, is almost done. Like, it's been almost done for a while, but actually you can, you can see it coming closer because everyone on the working group just wants it to happen. Um, when that happens, the Selenium project loses control of the level it's got right now. Um, and it becomes open to the standards bodies. It becomes far more amenable to the browser vendors to make changes that they want to. Um, so the interesting thing is the technical side of the project is going to become quieter and more quiescent. But um, there's going to be the explosion of mobile, which is already happening and we're seeing. Um, and I'm really hoping that we go from being um, the kind of documentation which is OK but not great <coughs> to having like awesome documentation and building the community around it. And so the core of the project, I think, is technically sort of fairly complete. But then on top of it, there's going to be all these other bits and pieces that need to happen. Um, and I think that's going to be sort of user groups, conferences, um, wrapper libraries, integrating with the tools such as like Hewlett Packard uh, are producing, um, better integration with the browser vendors to communicate with them, and, and all sorts of things. Um, and mobile will be obviously like the big thing. The internet of things people occasionally ask about, but nobody says, like, how will I do browser-based testing of the internet of things? So I'm pretending that's not happening. Um, anyone else have comments they want to add? I, I think you hit on the, the point about other things on top of the technology, but I do, I do think that better documentation, um, a newer website, and um, I think just general stuff, like uh, more of everything basically, that's not the technical implementation. So more conferences, more meetups, and all of those things, yeah. So follow-up question. So since morning, you would have faced a lot of questions about like what is in there uh, for the users from the Selenium, right, 3.0 or 4.0, right? Now, um, I ask you this question. What do you expect from the user group of Selenium, apart from just using Selenium, uh, to take it to the next level? What do I expect from a user group? Like a meetup or actual users of Selenium? I think 
users of Selenium to take it to the next level. Yeah. Read the documentation. Um, Yeah, we have to update the docs first. So some help updating the documentation <laughs> so you can then read it. Would be, it yeah. That would be really good. Um, just like the continued feedback and support. Like one of the things I really like about this project is in any city I go to, there are people who are using it. And everywhere I go, um, the community is enthusiastic, supportive, and happy. If you go to the IRC channel, um, it's... It's a wonderful place to be, right? It's just a group of friends talking, um, and occasionally people come in and go, like, I need a hand. And there's no flame wars. There's um, people are relatively polite. I mean, there's loads of off-topic conversations that happen. Like, every Friday, I try and link to Rebecca Black Friday. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes You're successful, are you? Yes. Yeah, Luke sometimes manages it. People have now got wise to the fact that this is what I do. Um, so there's things like that. Um, but the, and the, the mailing lists are remarkably civil and remarkably polite given the number of people on them and the size of it. So the thing that I'd like to see from the user group community is that continued goodwill, good spirit, um, and the ability to self-organize. Like uh, I went to Tel Aviv, I was invited to Israel to speak at a user group meeting. Nobody on the Selenium project had helped set that up. It was just people who were enthusiastic about Selenium had set it up, and it turned out there were you know, 100 people that would show up to it, which was phenomenal. And the same thing happened in London, um, New York, San Francisco, other cities. Like, people just organize and they communicate. And then the other nice thing about that is you have users supporting users. And that enables us to have the sort of web of, of trust and support where you know that if you have a problem, you can go for help. And that's really important. Cool. I think Hi, someone over there had a question for a long time. We'll go back there after that. Hi, Simon. Uh, actually, um, the question is related to Selenium Grid, uh, which currently I'm facing one issue related to that. Uh, actually, I have a couple of, uh, around 10 test cases. I'm successfully able to run multiple instances on Firefox, but uh, whereas the same result is not in IE. I'm, um, fa tests are failing uh, without um, reason. Uh, test isolation. Yes. That's the problem. Okay, so certainly way back in the day, Internet Explorer used to share cookie jars. So the problem is your tests run fine in parallel with Firefox, but they choke with parallel runs of IE yeah. on the same machine. Oh, same, same. On the same machine. Yeah, okay. So this is a test isolation problem. Um, Internet Explorer, certainly for the long time, shared a cookie jar between every instance running on the machine. You could fire it up and it would try and isolate itself. Jim Evans has done some amazing work to try and enable that isolation and make it good. Um, but it's really hard to do. And so um, probably with IE, the, the best way to get utilization and, and isolation for your tests is to spin up a virtual machine for each IE instance. Let that run. Throw that machine away when you're done with it. Um, and away you go. Now, virtual machines can be expensive to set up. They can be big. Um, but you can trim them down. And certainly at Google on the build grid, we were seeing st startup times of under 20 seconds for a VM running on a build grid. You can probably get faster than that with an SSD um, and decent memory. And then um, you can also put like one VM per core. And if you've got spinning disks instead of SSDs, you want one VM per spinning disk. Um, and that will give you decent utilization and throughput. Um, but I think grid, Dave, probably have more experience with Grid, uh, Dave and Luke have more experience with Grid than I do. And, and Marcus. And Marcus. In fact, everyone here has more experience <laughs> than I do. I have, I have virtually no experience with IE and Grid. I've, I've, I've avoided that like, like something you avoid a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you answered that correctly, though, Simon. Just okay. isolation, IE. And more, more hardware. More hard, yeah. Source Labs will help as well, and yeah, Browser Stack, and um, you know, third companies that provide provisioning in the clouds. Yeah. We have an uh, yeah, we have an amazing grid infrastructure at Retail Me Not. It's a little bit homegrown. It's uh, self-growing, self-shrinking, and we do 100% of our automated IE testing with Sauce. Uh, at my company, we 
have our own homegrown, but we do use virtual machines for IE, and all of them are isolated. Although we do not tear down between tests, but we'll tear down after a suite. Um, but we don't run uh, nearly as many tests on IE as we do on Firefox or Chrome, um, mainly because it's the test author's ability to control which browsers they run in, and they see a lot of flakiness in IE, and so they disable it. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll go back there. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, so, Selenium 3, awesome. Uh, we're uh, what's removed from core. Uh, that took a lot of work. Uh, and obviously, I understand the reasons uh, why you would want to do that because backwards compatibility, you want to make people happy. I was just wondering what the, the drive was. It took a lot of effort. Why, why didn't you just rip it out? Uh, was there like a, a huge user base that I just don't know about? Was where there some big players that are still using it? What was uh, what, what was the drive? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are there are. Um, I, I would probably put it in the millions of tests that still exist out there that are still with a RC based API. Um, I know at my company in particular, we have approximately seventy thousand RC style or uh, flavor, like basically with the leg RC, we're also lumping not only RC, but the WebDriver back Selenium into this leg RC package. So both of those combined, my company has about 70,000 of those. Um, that's, that's a massive amount of tests to, to attempt to migrate to just WebDriver. But, but if I understand correctly, you're, you're hoping to remove it anyway in, in two years now, right? Is that, that so going to make the difference? <laughs> Sorry. It really depends on which member of the, 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 the contributor team you talk to. Um, but there are a couple of things that, that we have as like uh, fundamentals of the project. One of those is, hey, look, when we're trying to think of how an API should behave, how would a user interact with the page? How would a user do that? Um, the other thing is I certainly have a strong belief that people have made a massive investment in their testing infrastructure and their existing tests. And to say to people, that investment is now worthless, is not a good thing to do. Now, what we can do is we can go, by the way, these things are going to go away. So if you look, like the Selenium interface is deprecated. Um, we've been saying for five years now, stop using Selenium, move on to the WebDriver APIs. Um, and we've been trying to encourage people like that. And you see sort of bit rotting code bases. Right, so um, you know your tests probably aren't going to be running for ten years, unless you've got some fantastically long-lived product. If you take a look at like the Standish report and things like that, the average lifetime for a project is about three years. So in theory, we could roll off. However, the problem that we're dealing with is one of inertia. Like companies that have made a strong investment in RC, continue that investment not because it's necessarily the right thing to do, but because that's how they do their testing. And switching their APIs is an investment they need to make. And so what we want to be able to do is allow people to maintain their existing investment and have a clear roadmap of where they should be going next. Um, and where they should be going next is the WebDriver APIs. And those WebDriver APIs are going to be stable between two, three, um, and probably four. But the underlying wire protocol is going to change between three and four, just as we removed Selenium Core between two and three. Um, so, like, the reason why we w went to the effort is because we care about our users and um, we wanted to do the best job we could. The nice thing that we have now is that all of the APIs all sit on top of the WebDriver APIs. Um, so, at least the next time we have to go through this exercise, and it's likely that at some point there will be something that's better than WebDriver out there, the next time we go through this exercise, everything will be just a simpler job to, to port. And so you'll have this sort of weird stack of legacy things going all the way back to like RC. Does that answer the question? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Cool. Does it make sense? Yeah. Oh. You wanted concrete, hard numbers, like 70,000 existing tests. And, <laughs> like, and I think last year at Selenium Conf, somebody was telling how they were running a million Selenium core tests every single day. Like, there's just a staggering number of things. And I think it might be a bit like PHP, 
Like, PHP is the dark matter of the internet. <laughs> like, you can't see it, nobody talks about it, and yet it's like 60 or 70% of all the code that's out there for servers, right? So, I think we have an engaged community who are here right now because you're engaged, because you're interested. You're using almost definitely the WebDriver APIs. I think if you went out to companies that made minimal effort with their testing, not because they don't want to care, but because they don't have the resources, I think you might find a larger percentage using RC. But again, because they don't come forward and because they don't say anything, that's just a gut feel. Right. We'll go back there. I think someone's, yeah. Hi, uh, this is Vignesh here. Uh, basically, I don't have a question, but I have a suggestion. Yeah, basically, I have a suggestion. Uh, it is uh, uh, for the element identification. Just like how we have we got find element by ID, export, and uh, CSS, why don't we have uh, why don't we ex expand the portfolio and then have uh, identify identifiers, uh, basically like uh, write methods so that uh, we can identify element by uh, title or alt text or placeholder, which are commonly used in all the brow browsers. I mean, all the HTML uh, uh, modern HTML pages also by label text. So can we uh, consider this as, that as an enhancement? for Selenium 3. Okay, can I just make sure I've understood? Is that finding an element by the value of an attribute or property? I don't know the difference. No one does. No one's rising to that bait. Property. There, there's a big debate in the project about one of the methods. Um, why haven't we got a locator for that? Uh, no one's ever asked for it. No one's ever contributed it. Um, and I think at this point, Luke. Uh, right, right now, I think if you were to say come into the IRC channel and ask that question, the answer you'd probably get is you can certainly wrap the um, the API yourself and create your own yeah, locator. Yeah. And usually, that would delegate down to something like execute script if you needed to. Um, although I would say from half of what you've just said, it sounds like more complex CSS selectors or XPath selectors that you could be using. There's, there's nothing stopping someone from essentially implementing their own via the JavaScript executor. And sending us a pull request. We would probably decline the pull Which request. Which we might decline. <laughs> um, <laughs> unless, um, <laughs> actually, uh, locators is a good thing to remind people of in the W3C world that only ID and CSS and XPath remain, I believe. Um, yes. The others are actually something like finding by class name or finding by tag name just delegates down into a CSS selector. We are actually going to be wrapping each of those calls and sending those for the implementations that speak W3C only. Yeah, I mean, the, the surface area of what we do is shrinking, not because we are taking away capability, but because it's possible to do an, an alternative inf implementation that means we have to, we have to um, ask vendors to implement less code and um, it's, equally capable. But then we care about your test, so none of the locators are going away that we currently have. They'll just continue delegating down in a sensible way that is um, equivalent and compatible. Okay, cool. I think you've been raising your hand for a while, and then we'll come back there. Okay, first there, and then come back. Uh, good evening again. Uh, sorry if I will be repeated. I just joined a bit later. Uh, I would like to hear from you. Uh, do you think that uh, running the Seleniums on the headless browser, such as the Phantom Jazz, uh, is really helping us winning at runtime? And uh, another question is uh, one what question at a time, so we can <laughs> yeah, answer it's, that. It's and related we'll to, to the same. So, uh, and uh, if there is uh, other other benefits on running on the headless browser rather than the running the tests on um, operation system that has no UI. I, I have opinions. It's one of the more terrifying things that people hear in this project. Yeah, <laughs> if someone's willing, I have opinions. Um, headless testing is very attractive, but ultimately pointless. I'll do the the sort of strong headline first, and now I'll add the caveats. Um, like, why do I say that? And and the reason is. Nobody out there uses PhantomJS as their primary browser, particularly in headless mode. Um, just no one, right? 
And so you can see teams spending time and effort fixing tests that won't fail in the real world. And your, your test automation engineers, your software engineers, the people maintaining these things, only have a finite amount of time, right? And so if you're asking them to fix something that isn't actually going to make any difference, then that's a point waste of time. Now, if those tests ran an order of magnitude faster, then it might be worth making that investment. But it turns out that it's still got to do um, effectively all the page layout, um, figure out everything, run all the JavaScript, do all that. The JavaScript engine is a few generations behind what is in the latest browsers, so the JavaScript engine is slower. Um, and the computational effort of laying out the page is still required. And so the only thing you're saving is painting the pixels to a screen. Well, woo. Like, that isn't the thing that takes all the time. Um, so from where I sit, I would actually prefer to use a virtual machine, spin up a real browser, just test with the thing that people use. PhantomJS is based on WebKit, so I would probably do something that is a WebKit-derived browser if I wanted comparable speed or better speed. And that kind of suggests Chrome, or maybe in the next release of uh, OS X, or Mac OS as it's now, now known, the Safari driver. Um, but I realize people might not agree with me there. I, I think we all agree. I, I, I'm, I can give some real world data to that. Real too. world data, rather real than just anecdote and opinion. <laughs> data. Data. <laughs> um, so uh, we encountered a bug, actually, in PhantomJS, especially with the version of WebKit that it was running, that our app crashed, actually, in only in the PhantomJS version that of WebKit that were, they were running. Um, it didn't happen in Chrome, didn't happen in Safari, didn't happen in any other real-world browsers, and our tests started failing, and we, um, we have a, a gate for every check-in that has, I mean, some, we have a smoke set uh, suite of tests that have to pass before any check-in can go into the source tree. Uh, and these were failing because of this Phantom JS bug. And so because of that, and we weren't able to upgrade, and, 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 uh, we actually switched to Chrome in, in those test suites. So performance the performance difference actually was, it's, it's slight. Um, we added prob probably like, Two minutes or so, I think, um, to the to, to the, the seventy thousand to the whole suite. Okay, um, but that oh, it, it was there's two. I, I I he's asking me time deltas of this thing, and I can't tell you because too many other factors were changing all the time. Um, so, but uh, at least uh, it's those tests have become stable and aren't causing any issues because of uh, the the driver itself. Um, I remember in 2007, we used to have the WebKit Bat uh, web driver, and that we did a lot of work on. They eventually just gave up on that as well. So for me, again, these headless browsers don't really have much value, much better test with the flaws of the real browsers, and they have plenty bugs for us to find without us testing on something that users don't use. Right. I'm, I'm guess you're going to say, but I need headless testing because dot dot no. dot. <laughs> okay. I just want to say that uh, I asked the question to find out that we are on the same ground, and I'm happy that uh, you all all you said I had the same thing uh, in my head uh, based on my experience because once I just in the morning I woke up and I say why not to run on a headless browser maybe it's faster or maybe it has some benefits. And in the middle, I find out that uh, the project will not be succeed, and just I drop it. And uh, all the problems that you are mentioning, I, I feel on my skin and doing all the bugs, and uh, even I even didn't win any time uh, on running on the headless browser because it's the time was the same. The only thing that I find out that is a positive thing that you can run on the um, OS without any uh, UI, but uh, it doesn't work to spend so much time for that. The initial, uh, the initial thing that we tried to do that, it was like running a test on the Phantom JS before the pu pull request, like to make sure that there is no massive uh, failures. Uh, then have on the real browsers that Nitro runs, which will give the real, real, ex like, um, real um, result. But then we drop it. 
because okay. there wasn't any any anything we would, we, would, uh, uh, we need to get it. I will come over and high five you later for having yeah. exactly the right way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Uh, I, I Another gentleman over there has been raising the hand for a yeah. while. Yeah, uh, I want to add one tidbit of information about PhantomJS and Phan uh, GhostDriver. It's been unmaintained for a few years now. Um, so be, anyone who wants to step up and help maintain GhostDriver, they're looking for people to continue to contribute. But it's become uh, relatively inactive on the, essentially on the WebDriver implementation in PhantomJS. I, I don't say that PhantomJS itself has been come inactive. It's our driver implementation in PhantomJS has been completely inactive. Yes. OK. So for those of you who, who are at home listening, but because uh, Aaron doesn't have a microphone. Um, Chrome are working on a headless implementation. When that ships, that's a real browser that people actually use. It might be worth testing on. Um, but I think we can now leave headless testing. Yeah, OK, sure. excellent. And take the next question. <laughs> right. So hello. Uh, I have a question mainly for Marcus, I'm guessing. Um, when building a Selenium framework, um, do you prefer to, uh, to build it more based on static methods and statically, and then not require the user of the framework to actually uh, initialize anything? Or do you prefer the more dynamic approach with initializing all the page objects uh, and stuff like that? And uh, if you could uh, elaborate on why. Uh, this is a coding preference question. Um, I'm yeah. sure. If I was being super hip and trendy, what I would do is a pure functional approach and uh, probably write it in like Clojure or Lisp dialect. Haskell. Or Haskell, yeah. Do it entirely in Haskell and you know, have the test run as a side effect, which is obviously a bad idea. Um, my personal preference is um, I tend to be a fairly um, classical OO developer. Like I like to have objects that do things and I like to object orientation. Um, I find statics to be unpleasant, just particularly in the environment I normally run, which is Java, because you screw up a whole bunch of things, particularly around the ability to run tests in parallel. Like the singleton implementation of I'll put the value on a static field uh, causes all, all manner of chaos, unless everything is completely stateless. If everything's completely stateless, it doesn't matter. I just knew things up anyway, because then I know that I've got these disposable things and there's no possibility of thread pollution. Um, does anyone else like to do things slightly differently? I hate statics. OK, good. So uh, most of us here would avoid statics, except? Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to go a level deeper and say dependency injection, non-static. Give the tester everything they need when they land in the universe. I'm, I'm maybe more extreme than, than Simon here. Thank you. So there is one thing I would add to that, which was the original, if you go back to like 2007 when I talk about page objects at GTAC, so we're now almost 10 years ago, the idea was that a page object was representing the services offered by a page. Um, and so you would return from those page objects the next thing that you would navigate to and things like that. Um, and therefore, it kind of implies that you're newing objects up and you're passing them around. Because what you're doing is you're saying to a user, here's the behavior of my application. And then the, app, the, 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 the page object is the only thing that knows about web element and how to find things and how to deal with that. And the advantage of that encapsulation is that if you change how the page objects behave, uh, if you change how the pages behave, then the page objects change. On top of that, the idea was that you would build workflows, which were more sophisticated. Um, uh, Anthony and Andy, tomorrow I think it is, have a talk about their evolution of that pattern into the screenwriter pattern, which seems really interesting as well. So if you're interested in writing your own test frameworks and how to do that in a nice way, that might be a really good talk to attend tomorrow. Cool. We have time for one last question, um, and this hi. gentleman is. I have been the mic already. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Slam. Ask your question, please. <laughs> So, All right, go ahead. Yeah, so I don't have a question, but uh, I would just like to share my experience with Selenium WebDriver and Angular JS applications, uh, since there was a question around. So uh, there's something called Fluent Selenium, which is available, which can be, uh, which works perfectly with Angular JS applications. 
Uh, it's a wrapper over Selenium WebDriver written, and uh, it has ng wait as a method, which actually waits for the AngularJS uh, page to load, and you can uh, you know work with that very well. I've been using it in my project, and I have not written any thread dot sleep or implicit waits, explicit waits uh, in my in my code. So you can just explore that. That sounds awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, what was the name of that Fluent framework again? Selenium. Can you remember where you can download it from? It's Fluent Selenium. Fluent Selenium. Yeah. Fluent Selenium. All right, oh, last Paul one Hammond's and then we wrap up. Yes. Sorry. Hi, myself Prashant. I'm the author of Selenium Essentials. I, I need a question as a kind of clarity. Could you is speak into the microphone, please? Uh, sure. The question is, is there any future support for WPF applications? We have we just opened that application in Windows machines, and we have the browser interface in it. Similarly, we have the same kind of application in Mac as well in Linux. So just want to know, is there any future support for that? WPF applications. Yes. OK, so Selenium is a browser automation framework. Yes. WPF is not a browser. So technically, no. no. Um, in reality, there's been a project that's been around forever called White. Um, which is written here in India, actually here in Bangalore, it was started. Dot net project. Yeah, it's a dot net project that that is pretty cool. Um, I think Microsoft have something. I think um, I'm not sure. I know that um, eBay. What did what did eBay have? Microsoft has UI Automator. Oh, they had they had a runner as well, which they open sourced and things like that. But yeah, Francois wrote it. Um, there are things out there that allow you to use the WebDriver APIs or similar APIs to test WPF applications. That sort of moment where you've got an embedded web control is difficult. Um, if you were using the original versions of water, that could you could say, hey, look, here's a control, and then it could hook into it. Um, we never implemented Actually, that. Actually, we have implemented something by ourselves. We are customized using C sharp, okay. sorry, um, C language, and we are able to get into that, but uh, while switching to one Windows to another Windows, we are facing issues. That's why. Okay. Point. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, the devil's in the details, yeah, right? I hope you got it. What I'm saying It's just a uh, just an application. Go ahead. That Excuse me. Yeah. One second. Um, if you're having a conversation, that's cool. But can you make it so we can't hear it here on the stage? Because I'm trying to listen to the question. Thank okay. you. Keep just on going. We give the microphone. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just it's just a application that you open, and we see the browser interface in it. So we are able to automate right now. You, we have implemented using C language, but uh, actually we have implemented through 32 bit, and uh, and we have to change it to 64 bit. So we have to entirely we have to change the scripts. So that is where we are facing issues because we have to switch from a parent to child. There we are facing issues. Yeah, I mean that just sounds horrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, I, I, all I can offer is sympathy and support. <laughs> <laughs> does, does anyone else have? Because even though if we implemented in Windows machine, the same we have to implement in Mac as well in Linux. That's why. OK, yeah. As far as I'm aware, there isn't a cross-platform, cross-windowing toolkit automation API that uses a WebDriver APIs. Hmm, even then. Anyway, um, yeah, sorry, I think is the best we can do here. <laughs> Maybe a hug or Thank, something like thanks that. Thanks, <laughs> All right, awesome. I think we are running short of time, so we'll try and wrap this up. Uh, so thanks for the Selenium community to come here and answer some of the questions in as entertaining manner as possible. Uh, hopefully you guys got some of the answers. Uh, these guys are around for tomorrow as well, so feel free to grab them and have more questions answered.